So <clears throat> last week, as I told you, um, <clears throat> I uh, hadn't looked closely at the schedule, and I had meant for last week to sort of be open-ended, and I might have canceled it. Um, I forgot that was in the system because I thought with all the snow days that I'd gotten rid of that extra lab day. Uh, so we started the respiratory system last week, um, looking at respiratory anatomy. Um, and then this week we're going to continue with the respiratory system. We won't actually get to covering it in lecture until Thursday. Um, and so what I'm going to do uh, today is talk about how breathing works and a few things about um, air pressure, and those sorts of things, um, to set up an exercise that we would do. Um, the exercise doesn't take that long, and so uh, I'm going to sort of do a little bit of the um, <coughs> lecture material here uh, so that you have a context for what we're going to be doing. Um, and then I won't be needing to cover that in uh, uh, class. Uh, <coughs> To remind you, uh, I said this, I don't know how clearly I said it last week uh, or in um, lab or lecture, but for the schedule for what we're doing, um, after changing things up last week, um, I shifted all the lab topics back a week, and then the week of Patriot's Day, um, that's the lab that I've canceled. So uh, <clears throat> all of that's reflected in the uh, lecture as it is now. Uh, okay, so when we get to talking about the respiratory system, there are a few different aspects of the physiology that we want to deal with. Um, and what I'm going to talk about here is breathing or ventilation, um, how we get air in and out of our lungs. Um, it's a very mechanical process uh, and pretty easy to understand, I think. Um, the other aspects of respiratory physiology are a little bit more complex because it's about how gases uh, dissolve in fluids and um, <clears throat> some chemistry that's taking place in the system uh, to carry those gases. Um, so that's what we're going to do in lecture, and here we're going to concentrate on exactly what's happening in breathing. Um, <clears throat> now, we looked at the autonomic system, we think about... Uh, involuntary aspects of what we do in our bodies or what our bodies do. And you probably have this impression that uh, <clears throat> breathing is an, is an involuntary act. Um, but uh, that's actually not true. What type of muscle tissue is the autonomic system responsible for controlling? Remember the types of muscle tissue, right? So which ones are controlled by the autonomic system? Who can give me an example of something the autonomic system does? Right. So what type of muscle is that going to be? And what do we call that? I think you said it while I was asking. Cardiac muscle. Right. Uh, what other type of um, <clears throat> muscle tissue does the autonomic system control? Cardiac muscle and smooth muscle. Where do we find smooth muscle? Some examples. Any ideas where we might find smooth muscle? Sure. The walls of the digestive tract. Great example. Um, which fits well. We'll talk about the autonomic system because really the parasympathetic system's main function is controlling um, uh, 
digestive function. Um, <clears throat> what type of muscle tissue does the autonomic system not control? Skeletal muscle, right. Um, and so we often think of skeletal muscle as being voluntary muscle. That's, in fact, one of the terms used to describe it. Uh, we can voluntarily control it. It's controlled by uh, motor neurons in the ventral horn of our spinal cord or in certain nuclei in our brainstem for the cranial nerves. And we have direct conscious control over them. Um, breathing, in fact, is dependent on skeletal muscle. Okay. Now, it's involuntary because, uh, well, we think of it as being involuntary because there's a part of the brain stem that controls breathing that does not need any input. It's completely active on its own. And uh, we'll talk about that in lecture when we get to talk about uh, regulated breathing, um, which is actually an unusual situation. Pretty much uh, to control skeletal muscle anywhere in our body, we need some sort of conscious act of volition to do that. Our, our um, higher centers of our brain have to send a, a, a signal out, or it's some sort of reflexive reaction to a stimulus, like you touch a hot stove and you pull your hand away. But breathing is actually under control of a nucleus that's active on its own without any outside input. Um, but breathe, or ventilation, that aspect of controlling air, is really a voluntary thing because we can do so much with it and we have so much ability to control it when we want to. For instance, that's what I'm doing right now. Speech is completely a matter of moving air out of your lungs across your vocal cords. And if we didn't have control over that, we wouldn't be able to do it in a, ma a manner to modulate frequency and uh, um, limit the exact amount of time that air is moving across to generate the uh, particular sounds that we have to make fairly complex speech sounds. So that's all basically to lead up to the idea that breathing is really um, a, ma a matter of skeletal muscle contractions. And I pulled this um, skeleton here just to talk a little bit about what's um, involved in that. The main muscle for breathing is the diaphragm. And it's the skeletal muscle wall between the thoracic and um, <clears throat> abdominal cavities. In its relaxed position, it's bowed upwards, making the floor of the thoracic cavity. When these fibers contract, it flattens out. Okay, so if you think of my fingers here as being fibers in this muscle, as the muscle gets shorter, it goes from this curved position to a flat position, basically pulling down on the thoracic cavity. Um, other muscles that are involved in breathing have to do with moving this uh, <clears throat> ribs. Um, there's two sets of muscles that are found in between the ribs. We call them intercostal muscles. There's an external set and an internal set, meaning just whether they're on the outside or the inside uh, surface of the rib cage. The external intercostals pull one rib up closer to the one above it. And <clears throat> as a group will basically lift the rib cage up. Now, as I'm demonstrating this on the skeleton, I'm really exaggerating what they can do. They aren't gonna make the rib cage lift up that much, but uh, kind of like an accordion, each rib is pulled up closer to the one superior to it, and from that, uh, along with the diaphragm going down, it expands the thoracic um, <coughs> uh, volume even more. The, Internal intercostals do basically the opposite. They basically pull each rib down closer to the um, one inferior to it, which is going to sort of pull everything down. When I do this on a model, I kind of think of somebody that, you know, wearing a three-piece suit and they're pulling their vest down over their 
growing font or something like that. So it just pulls down on a rib cage like that, doing the opposite. Um, for basic breathing, what all of you are doing right now, that's uh, the diaphragm, the external intercostals are all that really need to be involved. Um, just simply expanding the volume of the rigid rib cage will help pull air into your lungs. This model right here does a good job of illustrating. If I pull the stopper out of this bell jar, um, attach the, or going through the stopper is a little wide tube, and off either branch of the wide tube is a, um, a balloon representing the respiratory tract, as we talked about last time. Okay. So I can expand the lungs just by blowing air in there. But um, the rest of this model, the uh, bell jar and the latex um, <coughs> cover to the bottom here, represents the rib cage and the diaphragm. Now the bell jar is rigid, so we're not going to see the rib cage part of the model expanding. It's really just about the diaphragm doing its job. But if I put the stopper back in the bell jar, so now the lungs are contained within the rib cage. Like so I can just pull the diaphragm down and the um, balloons inflate, which might not quite be obvious because of how I set this particular thing up. But if I push up on the diaphragm, you can see the balloons completely inflate. And so breathing is just a matter of this movement back and forth. And if I do it, okay, if I do it too hard, I rip something. Um, but the point I was trying to do make was, you can hear the sound of air moving in and out of this hole here. Okay. A lot of people will think of um, breathing as being sucking air in and blowing air out of your mouth, sort of a kind of scent, uh, experience, because we feel it moving in and out of our mouth and we can hear this sound associated with it. But really the sound is just the air being pulled past this opening. Um, <clears throat> And you can exaggerate that sound by uh, changing the size of the opening in your mouth. That's what I'm but the movement is actually all taking place in the rib cage, um, or in the thoracic cavity, I should say. Now, um, actually, before we look at the um, uh, process of breathing in this section of the um, chapter, let me back up for a second to uh, the anatomy of the lungs. Um, when I was talking about the respiratory tract, I talked about the bronchi branching into the lungs and going down to the alveoli. Uh, but another aspect of the lungs that we need to think about is their relationship to the rib cage, how they're attached. Um, and they're attached or they interact with the rib cage through what's called the pleura. Uh, the pleura is and this will load soon enough. Um, the pleura is a um, <coughs> serous membrane, much like the pericardium around the heart that we talked about back in the cardiovascular system. It's a simple squamous epithelium and it's associated connective tissue that covers the outsides of the lung and lines the inside of the thoracic cavity. Um, <coughs> for the medial aspects of the lung, it's going to line uh, sort of that space there. So the um, pleura of the lungs and the pericardium of the heart will actually kind of come up against each other, um, <clears throat> sort of lining their respective spaces. So now that this picture is loaded, um, <clears throat> the inset over here kind of illustrates that. Um, here we see the intercostal muscles, which are skeletal muscles. Um, this isn't saying specifically internal external muscles, just intercostal muscles. So this is a wall of the um, <clears throat> thoracic cavity. And lining inside of that wall is one layer of this uh, pleural membrane called the parietal pleura. Parietal is referring to the body wall, so it's the uh, layer that's lining the body wall. And then 
<clears throat> here we have the lung, and covering the outside of the lung is the visceral pleura. And between the two is a little cavity, which is filled with fluid, um, which is just like the pericardium, the visceral pericardium and the parietal pericardium are separated by a little bit of space where there's some fluid. The fluid acts as a lubricant so that when the heart moves within the pericardium and the lungs move within the pleura, it provides a little bit of, um, <clears throat> or it limits the amount of friction uh, between the moving organ and the um, surrounding space. But the pleura has a, another very important role to play. Now, the pleura and the pericardium, both of them are closed cavities. Um, <clears throat> it's one continuous membrane that's covering the outside of the organ and then extending to line the inside of the space. So being an enclosed cavity, nothing's supposed to get in or out. It's uh, sort of a fixed space. If I were to <clears throat> try to pull the parietal pleura away from the, pleura, the visceral pleura, as that space expands, it's actually going to uh, create some uh, Kind of like suction, it's not exactly suction, but uh, it'll kind of pull that away. <clears throat> the only example I can come up with to kind of illustrate this is if you've ever tried to um, unwrap something that's been shrink wrapped and you just can't get your fingers to grab onto the shrink wrap, you've had that experience? Sure, you've had that experience. Um, <clears throat> it's really hard to pull the shrink wrap away because the shrink wrap is sealed around and you'd have to get some air into the space between the shrink wrap and whatever it is that it's wrapped around to be able to pull the shrink wrap away. But since it's sealed, no air can get in there. That's sort of the same thing here. Um, nothing can get into uh, the pleural cavity to fill it if we try to separate the two sides from each other. So that means that with when we breathe, the rib cage or the diaphragm, which the parietal pleura is attached to, expands and it pulls the parietal pleura away from the visceral pleura, but the visceral pleura has to kind of stay close to it. Again, uh, you can't really pull the two apart because there's no way for any air or anything to get in there to fill that space to, to take care of it. So when the um, thoracic wall expands, the parietal pleura follows with it because they're attached. And then it pulls the visceral pleura because this cavity is closed and you can't really separate the two layers of it. And that's attached to the outside of the lung, so that's going to pull the lung. And when, your when your thoracic cavity expands because of the um, <clears throat> mu uh, muscles I was just talking about, it's going to necessarily pull the uh, lungs with. Now, um, Aside from the fact that I actually ripped the uh, 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 latex cover over the bottom of this that represents the uh, diaphragm, the idea is kind of true here. Nothing can get into the bell jar. It's now completely sealed. So when I pull the latex down, uh, the volume within the bell jar is constant. And so the only thing that ha can happen to offset what I'm doing pulling the latex is that air fills the balloons and they expand to fill the difference in the volume in this bell jar. That's exactly what's happening with the lungs. When your diaphragm descends or the rib cage expands, the lungs basically fill, it pulls air into the lungs. Depending on how deeply you're breathing, there are different muscles that get involved. And uh, breathing has two phases to it. There's inhalation and exhalation. Inhalation is really all that's driven by the muscles for the most part. So diaphragm goes down and the rib cage expands. That's going to basically pull air into uh, the lungs. When you exhale, when you exhale, and as opposed to me, because I'm doing something very different because I'm speaking, those muscles relax. The external intercostals and the diaphragm relax, and they go back to their resting position. The 
lung has elastic tissue in it, and the, the elasticity of that tissue kind of pulls everything back to its original uh, size, and that's going to help to push air out. Okay? So for you, when you're breathing, all you're doing is the diaphragm and external intercostals are contracting to expand the ribcage, pulling air in. And then when they relax, the elastic tissue in the lungs basically snaps everything back and you push your air back out of your lungs. What I'm doing is different because I'm speaking, I'm forcing air out. And there are muscles that are responsible for uh, exhalation when you need to force air out. The internal intercostals, which do the opposite of the external intercostals, since they do the opposite as far as muscle is concerned, they're also going to do the opposite as far as function is concerned. So while the external intercostals help to expand the ribcage, the internal intercostals help to sort of pull it down, and that's going to help to push air out, force air out for exhalation. That does not need to happen only when you're trying to force air out, which I'm doing because I'm, I have, you have to force air out across your vocal cords to produce speech sounds. Also attached across the bottom of the ribcage are the abdominal muscles. And the abdominal muscles will help to pull down and again squeeze air out. But if I'm talking for a long time and I'm pulling down and I'm pushing all that air out, I'm eventually going to empty my lungs out. So I got to take a big breath. And when you take a big breath like that, some other muscles get involved. Okay? None of you are doing that again because you're just doing your basic diaphragm, external intercostal, <coughs> excuse me, breathing. But um, when you take a deep breath, then um, there are muscles that basically pull the top of the rib cage up like this. Okay. And I'm putting my fingers where I've put them on purpose. The main uh, <coughs> muscle that does that is the sternocleidomastoid. Okay. Its origin is in the sternum and the clavicles, which is sternocleidoid. Cla oops, sorry. Sternocleido. And then mastoid refers to the mastoid process of the um, temporal bone, where its insertion is. I did say origin and insertion. We tend to think of skeletal muscles as pulling the insertion towards the origin. But when you're breathing, when you're taking a deep breath, the sternocleidomastoid pulls the origin of the muscle towards the insertion because other muscles fix the neck in place. And so the um, skull's not going to move and the, the rib cage can be pulled up. Also in this area, there are some other muscles uh, there's the scalenes and the pectoralis minor uh, muscles that are attached across the upper uh, few pairs of ribs, helping again to pull them up, sort of doing more than the external intercostals. Um, and all of that will allow for taking a really deep breath. <clears throat> now, um, I want to go back to. Um, the uh, process of breathing section um, because understanding breathing also requires us to understand a little bit about uh, pressure now the pressure that's involved in breathing air pressure aspects isn't really any different than the pressure that we thought about when we we're talking about blood okay? liquids and airs sorry liquids and gases uh, behave very similarly uh, in regards to pressure. Right? <laughs> Fluid dynamics includes liquids and gases. Um, and so when we say laws of fluid dynamics, um, we're referring to both of those. And either will move from high pressure to low pressure. Just when your, your heart beats, it generates a bunch of pressure squeezing in the left ventricle, and that pushes the blood out to the aorta and the pressure will push the blood all the way through the systemic circulation until it comes back to the right side of the heart. Okay. High pressure drives the movement of blood. Same thing's true of air. Air is automatically going to move from high pressure to low pressure. Okay. Now, if you think about air and movement and high pressure and low pressure, that might remind you of watching the weather or something like that. When they talk about high pressure and low pressure uh, systems in the weather, what we can necessarily 
assume from that is that wind is going to be blowing from the high pressure to low pressure. And okay, that's the movement of air uh, down a pressure gradient. And that's largely what they're talking about when they're describing weather. Okay. Um, we don't need to get into that exactly, but what's important because when we're talking about wind, it's an open system, sort of, um, and air is moving all around the planet. Uh, here, talking about breathing, we also want to consider what volume has to do with it um, because the lungs are contained and uh, we can define the volume of that quite a bit. Now, um, this uh, uh, equation up here um, <clears throat> says P sub 1 V sub 1 <coughs> equals P sub 2 V sub 2. Uh, that's the initial pressure and volume equals the second pressure and volume multiplied together, I suppose you would say. Um, all other things being equal, if you're just looking at pressure and volume, when pressure changes, volume is going to change too, and they're going to kind of balance each other out. So this picture shows, um, let me make the picture a little bit bigger. Um, a contained volume of air <clears throat> at a particular, you know, this is V1. Okay. Um, at this pressure, let's call it a liter, uh, I mean, sorry, at this volume, let's call it a liter, the pressure of the air in here, um, let's call it one unit of pressure, one atmosphere of pressure, or something like that, um, <clears throat> has to be equal to what we're going to see in the second jar, where the volume changes, uh, gets smaller, the pressure is going to go up. Now, pressure that we're talking about here is basically the additive, um, excuse me, uh, force of air particles running into the walls of the container. Okay? In this room right now, there's a bunch of air molecules, oxygen, carbon dioxide, nitrogen, uh, water vapor, um, I think I'm not done. But uh, anyways, those are all moving around in here. The distance between one particle and the next, one molecule and the next, is so great relative to their size that they all basically um, act independently. They don't run into each other. But they do run into the ceiling and the floor and the wall and our body and all of that sort of thing. Each little impact uh, generates a certain amount of force. Exactly how much, I don't know, but it's really, really small. Um, but if you add up all of the impacts of air molecules against you or against the floor, the ceiling, or the wall, there's going to be an overall force. That's the air pressure in here. Okay. If we were to compress this room and make it half as uh, big as it is without letting any air out or in and not letting any of us out or in, then the air pressure is just going to increase with that, I mean, is that right? Yeah. It's going to increase with the volume decrease. Okay. Um, so the numbers aren't in this picture, but let's pretend. This is a liter of air at one atmosphere of pressure. And when we decrease the volume to half a liter, the pressure is necessarily going to increase to two atmospheres. Uh, because P sub 1, V sub 1 has to equal P sub 2, V sub 2. Okay, so P sub 1 is 1, and V sub 1 is 1, and P sub 2 is 1 half, then V sub, nope, I got those backwards. Um, okay, let me write this on the board. For, uh, if I try to do this all... Verbally, I'm going to get messed up. Okay. So, again, and I can't do subscripts here. Okay, so can't do subscripts. So P1V1, the first pressure in the first volume, equals P2V2, the second pressure in the second volume. So let's say that this is... Um, one atmosphere times one liter of air, okay? 
And so if um, uh, how many atmospheres would we have if the volume went to half a liter? I'm going to assume this is obvious to you. Okay, One times one is going to be the same as two times half. See? Everybody follow the math there? Okay. Mm -hmm. Which means for this to work out, that has to be two atmospheres. Just <clears throat> the product of these two has to equal the product of these two. If volume goes down by a half, volume has to go up, has to double. No, sorry. Volume goes down by half, pressure has to double. Okay. Um, if the volume went down to a fourth, then uh, pressure would have to go up to four. Okay. Again, so that the uh, math works out. Okay. Now, the pressure that we deal with is not in atmospheres. Okay. An atmosphere is, in fact, a measure of air pressure. It happens to be the measure of air pressure at sea level, one atmosphere of pressure. That's a lot of pressure. And the kind of changes that we're going to be talking about are very, very small. And so atmospheres is not a very useful uh, unit to use. Instead, we're going to stick with the unit that we're familiar with, millimeters of mercury. One atmosphere of pressure is equal to 760 millimeters of mercury, okay? So the amount of change that we're going to be dealing with is easy to deal with in millimeters of mercury because uh, it's a small unit. Um, when you breathe in, the expansion of your rib cage uh, causes a slight increase in volume such that the pressure in your lungs drops to about 758 uh, millimeters of mercury. So it's a really, really small change in volume. And we're not going to even bother trying to measure that volume. We could work it out. Um, but it's not that important. Um, we're talking about really small changes. And so uh, millimeters of mercury is a great um, unit for us to work in because it'll uh, allow us to work in the, um, the amount of change we're going to see. Whoops, where was I? Um, OK. So. Uh, if the change here was from 760 millimeters of mercury to, um, what would that be, 380 millimeters of mercury. Uh, nope, I'm messing that all up. Uh, again, one liter to half liter, then uh, it would be 760 to twice that, which would be 1520 millimeters of mercury. Okay. Trying to do the math in my head real quick, which I always mess up on. Um, so whether we say one atmosphere or 760 millimeters of mercury, um, we're going to see those kinds of changes. Um, so this picture is kind of talking about uh, the relationship between the pleura and the um, lungs. Uh, it points out a few things that I don't, don't want to get into, but you can read um, as you're going through the chapter in more depth later on. Um, but as the lung volume increases, the pressure here decreases to less than the pressure outside. Um, so if atmospheric air is 760 millimeters of mercury and your lungs have expanded slightly so that the pressure there is 758 millimeters of mercury, then that little difference in pressure, 2 millimeters of mercury worth of change, is enough for air to move in from outside to fill the lungs, okay? Until the lungs uh, <clears throat> reach that an equilibrium, until the pressure in those expanded lungs reaches 760 millimeters of mercury. And then those muscles relax, 
the elastic tissue recoils and it sort of squeezes back in. And now the, the volume has gone down as much as it went up a second ago. And what was 760 millimeters of mercury once you've filled your lungs um, drops to, uh, <clears throat> sorry, no. The volumes drop, so the pressure goes up to like 762 millimeters of mercury. Now there's higher pressure in the lungs than outside, and so the air is going to rush out. Okay. And it's really just about manipulating the volume of the lungs so that the pressure uh, changes in and out of the lungs and uh, we drive air in and out. Okay. Um, uh, here's a picture kind of showing the diaphragm and rib cage changing in size and position so that we can draw air in or uh, eventually air will leave when those muscles relax. Um, this picture here kind of gets into um, <coughs> there we go. Um, the pressures that are uh, I mean sorry the volumes that we see in the lung. Now this is a standard picture that you're going to see in any um, A and P book like this. Um, the numbers that are expressed here are shown in the um, text, but I just want to talk about this a little bit. Um, the numbers here are based on the averages for uh, the male system. There's different numbers that apply to the female system just because of the sexual dimorphism. Um, on average, men are larger than women, and men have more muscle mass, and they need to, um, again, get more oxygen to that. So they're, the respiratory system is a little bit different. But uh, it works on exactly the same principle. The numbers might be different, but the principle is the same. Um, now, what we're looking at here, this graph, is what we would get from recording the data collected by what's called a spirometer. A spirometer is just measuring breathing. Um, there's two types of spirometers. There are recording spirometers and non-recording spirometers. Uh, a recording spirometer uh, can directly translate the volume of air that moves in and out of the lungs to a graph like this. Um, now, what has to be established before you can actually collect this data is um, what the total lung capacity is. And um, I've actually had this done. I've, I've been to uh, a breathing clinic and had this material done because I used to take a medication that had a potential side effect of uh, compromising respiratory function. I don't take that anymore, so I don't have to go in and have this checked on a regular basis. But, uh, all you're doing is you're sitting there and you're breathing into this tube uh, with your nose pinched so that it's measuring all of the air that's coming in now. Um, and somehow by making you do all this breathing, the, the system can figure out what your lung capacity is, and so it sets up the scale. How exactly that happened, I didn't pay that much attention to, so I can't say too much about it. But let's assume that that's been established. Now we can breathe in and out, and we can measure different volumes. Now, the yellow bar across the middle that's marked tidal volume, that represents your regular breathing. Okay. Um, you breathe in and out about a half a liter of air, 500 milliliters of air. That's actually consistent for men and women. Um, and so that's what that, that first little peak represents. It goes from and again, the numbers aren't exactly on this uh, graph, but um, I've seen other graphs with the numbers on there, so I'm going to use some numbers. Um, from about 2,400 milliliters to about 2,900 milliliters. The yellow bar going across the middle that's marked tidal volume is just a little bit below the 3,000 milliliter mark. Okay, so it's 2,400 to 2,900. Um, so you breathe in 500 liters, of, 500 milliliters of air, and you breathe out. That's just basic breathing. It's called tidal volume because kind of like the tide, like waves at the beach, just moves in and out. Um, but notice that on this graph, especially, it's 
near the center. It's actually a little bit below the midpoint of total lung uh, volume. Okay. Um, we don't use all of our lung volume all the time. Okay. We don't need to. Uh, this is just basic uh, maintenance breathing. If you wanted to fill your lungs completely, that's sort of where the uh, line goes, all the way up to the top, again, using the sternocleidomastoids and the scalenes and the pectoralis minor muscles and those sorts of things, you can expand your rib cage as much as possible and fill your lungs. And that's going to get all the way up to the top of the graph. That's going to be uh, your overall lung capacity. Um, and then if you exhale all of that air and keep exhaling until you breathe all the way out, the, the number gets all the way to the bottom. And then, uh, but notice that it doesn't actually get to the bottom of the graph. There's some more space beyond that. Um, because you can't completely empty your lungs. If your lungs are completely empty, then you have a vacuum there. The vacuum just won't happen, it won't work. The lungs would completely collapse and they would never, they wouldn't work anymore. So you have to keep some air in your lungs. Um, and so after breathing out all that's possible to breathe out, um, uh, the air, the lungs fill again back to the tidal volume range and breathing goes back to normal. So that's what the black line there suggests, those kinds of uh, breaths. Um, tidal volume, like I said, is about half a liter, 500 milliliters. Um, the air that's pulled in to fill the lung all the way up to capacity, everything from tidal volume up is called inspiratory reserve volume. If you need to keep that much air on hand, take a deep breath, roll your breath or something like that, that's how much you can pull in. It's usually a little bit more than half of your overall lung capacity. Um, so if you're about to dive underwater or something like that, you take a deep breath, you fill your lungs with as much air as possible so that you have a supply of oxygen available um, until you can breathe again. Um, now, if you exhale all of the air that you can out of your lungs, the part below tidal volume is what's called the expiratory reserve volume. Now, we don't tend to actually <coughs> jump into or tap into the expiratory reserve volume. Um, but I am, as I'm breathing to uh, produce speech, I'm exhaling. So as I talk more and more, I'm going to eventually use up all that air and get down to the and I take a breath. Um, but all of you aren't tapping into that right now because you're not producing that speech like that. Okay. Um, but there is a point where you have to take a breath, and it's not when your lungs are completely empty. That last little bit down there, the dark blue band, is called residual volume. And that's the air that has to remain in there. Now, that's not the same air over and over again. Whenever you breathe in, all of the air in your lungs mixes up, and you breathe out different specific air particles. Um, so it's always mixing up. It's not like there's some corner of your lung somewhere that has air that's been there since the third grade, and there are cobwebs, and that's what um, The air is always mixing up when you're doing that. Um, so the other uh, bars there kind of define different parts. So the expiratory reserve volume and the residual volume together are what we call functional residual capacity because we don't tend to tap into that. Functionally speaking, we don't tend to go below uh, tidal volume. So we have this residual amount of air in our lungs pretty much all the time, um, except when we're speaking something like what I'm doing now, um, that doesn't, we don't ever tap into. And then the tidal volume and the inspiratory reserve volume is sort of the air that we can and tend to breathe in and out. Um, probably especially as I'm talking and I'm demonstrating deep breaths and something like that, you're going to occasionally take a yawn. Okay? So that's going to uh, pull more, more air in for the inspiratory capacity there. Um, but um, you don't necessarily need it all the time. Okay? Now, if you talk about all of the volume of air that you can move in and out of your body all the time, or not all the time, but completely, uh, really the, the line from the top of inspiratory reserve to the bottom of expiratory reserve, all of that is the vital capacity. That's all the air that you can move in and out of your lungs um, when you really try to. Okay. Um, and what's left over is that residual volume that you can't get rid of. 
Um, and then, of course, at the end, the total lung capacity would be all of the air that could fit in your lungs. That would include, include the residual volume because that's air that's always in your lungs. Now, the exercise that we're going to do is actually to look at these volumes. Okay? We don't have recording spirometers. Um, actually, we recently got some, but uh, um, I haven't gotten the program that runs them to work quite right. So we're going to stick with uh, the non-recording spirometers that we've always had. And so I've gone into the other lab so that we have plenty so everybody can uh, do this at once. And so in these um, blue boxes here, we have these things which are non-recording spirometers. Now they're non-recording because the data that you collect from any given breath um, isn't going to be stored anywhere other than where you write it down. Okay, so you have to keep track of this. Uh, the data, the numbers that we get, are represented by where the needle points on the top. Um, the needle moves when air moves through this, and there's a little turbine or something like that, that pushes the needle around. And then you measure the volume based on the um, <coughs> scale at the top. Now the scale is, can rotate because the needle moves only in one direction. After you've finished uh, collecting data, the needle doesn't go back to zero. Instead, you move zero to the needle. Okay? And you'll need to reset to zero every time you go through. The scale goes from zero all the way around to 7,000. Okay? Now, it's actually, legal, legal, it's actually labeled CCM, which means cubic centimeters. And we've been talking about milliliters there. A cubic centimeter is a milliliter. Okay? A milliliter is just the amount of volume that's, that we see in a cube that's one centimeter on every side. Um, so cc's, ccm here, or uh, milliliters are the same volume. So this goes up to seven liters worth of air, okay, which is more than enough. The, up here we're talking about total lung capacity of six liters for men, um, and with residual capacity we don't need that much um, to measure. I've had one person claim that they uh, exhaled enough that the, the needle went all the way around past 7,000, but I don't believe they did it right. I don't, I don't think that was real. So, um, now, very important with these things, these are meant to only record expiration, to me, which means only breathe out through these things. Don't breathe in. Um, and in this bag here, I have these highly technologically advanced uh, personal protective pieces that you want to put over the end. So, cardboard two. so grab a cardboard tube, put that over the end, and this is what you touch, touch your lips to. Only exhale through this. You're not going to be inhaling what somebody else has exhaled through this. Um, now, what you're going to be doing with these is measuring three things. Um, and after measuring those three, three things, you'll be able to um, calculate a fourth thing. Now, the first thing that you're going to measure is the vital, uh, sorry, tidal volume. Okay. Now, um, to get an accurate number for any of these recordings, we really want to take a series of measurements and average the number. Now, the more measurements you take of something, the better predict predictive value those samples are going to be. Um, but there's a limit to being able to do that. If it takes 20 samples and, and average them all together, then you're going to get a very accurate representation. But it takes a long time. So for this, I want you to take three measurements, trial one, <coughs> Trial two and trial three. Okay. And then average those, and that value is going to be uh, the data point that you use for tidal volume. And you want to do the same thing again okay, with um, uh,
Same thing again for expiratory reserve volume. And then you're going to do the same thing again for vital capacity. All three of these you're going to measure by exhaling. Okay. The other thing that you want to get is inspiratory reserve volume. Inspiratory vol reserve volume. But you don't want to measure that. Okay. Instead, you calculate that based on really the definition of what vital capacity is. So let me go back to this. Okay, vital capacity here uh, is everything except residual volume. And if we go back over here, okay, take out residual volume, what we have left is expiratory reserve volume, tidal volume, and inspiratory reserve volume. Okay. So uh, vital capacity equals ERV plus TV plus IRV. Whoops. Vital capacity is those three things together. If we solve for IRV, then vital capacity uh, whoops, minus the quantity ERV plus TV. So all I'm doing here is uh, rearranging this first uh, equation to solve for IRV. So if I subtract the quantity of ERV plus TV from both sides, then that gives us IRV. See the, the algebra behind that? Okay. Um, so we're measuring these three values here. And so we can calculate what IRV is from them without having to um, uh, inhale through the um, recording, uh, non recording from. So I'm going to demonstrate this for you. Um, I'm not going to. Show me this knocking. Oh. oh. Um, I'm not going to do three trials of each. I'm just going to uh, do it once to demonstrate. But this is what you want to do. Now, the probably the hardest part of this would actually be um, the tidal volume part. Because of how this works, um, it needs a little bit of force behind it to really get the turbine moving and the, the um, needle moving. So you got to kind of try it a few times and see if you can get a good sense of it. Also, on the scale on the top of the non-recording spirometer, between zero and a thousand cc's, there are no tick marks. Okay, and again, cc's and milliliters are the same thing. Tidal volume should be less than a thousand cc's. Should be 500 or so. So, if you start with a zero and uh, you exhale through it, the needle is going to be pointing into that space between the two and you'd have to estimate what it is. It would be better, actually, to use 1,000 as zero, and then the tick marks representing 100 cc's each between 1,000 and 2,000. You'll be able to get a more accurate number. Okay. So start there and exhale through that. Now, when I've explained how to do this over the years, I've always said um, exhale into your mouth without it you know, blowing out. And then exhale that or push that air into this. I don't actually do that, <laughs> um, but it seemed like a way to explain it, but I don't think it really helped anybody. Um, the idea here is that normal exhalation, tidal volume exhalation, has very little force behind it, and so it really doesn't work. So what you have to do is you actually have to prep and push the air through. And if you could breathe in and out of your mouth, which I wasn't actually doing, I just making it look like After you fill your mouth, then push that air out quickly, that'll make it work. I don't think that's what I do, and I don't know if it'll work for you that way. 
but you kind of have to see if you can get an accurate reading, and you're going to see something in the 500 range. Um, so it's going to be something like this. Okay. And I've just been doing this enough that I kind of know uh, what it feels like to exhale tidal volume and just breathe out. You might need to do it a few times, maybe more than three trials to get an accurate feel for it. Okay. Uh, so doing that just now, I got 400... Um, <clears throat> I got 400 milliliters, which actually I tend to have a little bit lower than that. I think my average is about 375, but um, I'm not going to do three trials. I'm just going to put one value in there, but it'd be like that. Okay. Now, after you do each one, make sure that you put the pointer back to zero, whether you're actually using zero or using a thousand. And then when you're done with tidal volume, when you move to expiratory reserve volume, definitely put the pointer on zero because it's going to be more than a thousand cc's if you uh, exhale through this. So you're going to be able to measure this fine. Now for expiratory reserve volume, what you want to do is just breathe along normally and with one of those breaths, breathe out as much as you can. Okay. So it'll be something like this. Okay, I got a bit of a headache, but that didn't work too long. Um, mm -hmm. Let me try this. Did you turn it from zero? Sorry? Did you turn it to zero? Yeah, put it back. All right, that was much better. Still have a bit of a headache, but um, now actually, what I was doing there, if you might have noticed it, I put it up to my lips, but I didn't close my lips around it for a breath, and that might have been what helped me the second time around. But um, so again, uh, don't breathe in through this. So I was breathing through my nose, but I had this up. So when I was ready to take the next exhale, I just closed my lips and breath breathed out completely through there. And what I got today was. 1,500 milliliters. Um, now, I actually didn't measure expiratory reserve volume. Okay. What I did, uh, let's just read this backwards. So I was breathing in and out normally, and then for one exhalation, I breathed out all I could. Okay. So actually what I'm getting here is tidal volume plus expiratory reserve volume. Okay. Um, now, I'm going to actually leave it that way because it's useful. Um, but really, if I were to get an accurate ERV, I'd have to subtract tidal volume from this number here, which would suggest that it's about 1,100, which is a bit uh, low. Um, <clears throat> on average, it's about 1,200 milliliters. Um, I tend actually to get uh, about 1,300 milliliters myself, um, but we'll work with this number here. Then the next one you're going to do is vital capacity, which is VC, not CV. I just realized I did that backwards. But again, put it back to zero, and definitely this can be on zero because this is going to be a, a fairly large number. What you want to do here is fill your lungs to capacity. Okay, get all the air you can possibly get into your lungs. So all the way up here, and then you're going to exhale all that you can until you can't exhale anymore. So really vital capacity is this entire uh, event right here. Now we want to kind of uh, push it a little bit to get the best recording out of it that we can. And so um, we're going to take advantage of the relationship between the thoracic and abdominal cavities. They're both closed cavities, and so when you're breathing, when your diaphragm goes down, it compresses your abdominal cavity a little bit. 
And then when the diaphragm goes up, part of what pushes it up is that pressure in your abdominal cavity pushing it back up in place. So if you bend over, you're actually going to push your abdominal organs up into your diaphragm a little bit, which is going to push the diaphragm into as elevated a position as possible. And your lung capacity is going to be as low as possible. And then when you stand up and you expand your uh, abdominal cavity, if you're breathing in when you do that, then the diaphragm can kind of go down as far as possible, fill your lungs as full as you possibly can. Okay. And then with exhaling again, you bend over and it pushes it all out. Okay. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to bend over and clear my lungs of all of the air that I possibly can. And then I'm going to stand up and breathe in and fill my lungs. And then I'm going to exhale through this as I bend over again and get all of that volume out that I can. Okay. Something like this. Again, put it on zero before you start. Excuse me. Okay, so um, that got me up to <coughs> that got me up to thirty eight hundred milliliters, which mm, well, that's about average for me, I guess. Um, <clears throat> so with those numbers. <coughs> all of which I collected by breathing out through this thing, I can uh, get my IRV, which is uh, 3,800 minus, um, yeah, the 1,500. And this is why I stick with this number, because that number is actually that quantity, okay, because I'm measuring both together. Um, if you took this number and subtracted it from what you got for each of these trials and then average that, you could do that. But you might as well average the actual number you get from breathing out uh, all of a, your breath from normal breathing, okay? Because it's both together and it's what we actually need for this calculation, which means this ends up being, what, 2,300 milliliters? Um, that's my IRV. Those numbers are not quite what are in this picture here. Okay, um, total capacity is six thousand. Um, so from twenty nine hundred up to six thousand, that's actually thirty one hundred. I just calculated mine's about twenty three hundred. Um, my tidal volume is four hundred. Um, this is five hundred. Um, my expiratory reserve volume is. Uh, 1100 this is actually 1200 so my number is a little small um, also uh, <clears throat> I have a horrible headache and so when I do these deep breaths I get this like shooting pain right here so I'm kind of compromising my numbers a little bit there too but uh, so that's how the process works okay now there are um, <clears throat> six of these blue boxes um, Let's see, uh, one of them had uh, yeah, this one you can hear. This has some uh, cardboard tubes in it. Uh, but if there are not cardboard tubes in the blue box that you grab, um, please get some Come up here. Done. Um, and with six, maybe you could work in uh, pairs or something like that using them. Or yeah, there's 12 in here. Um, so you work in pairs, and then if you feel kind of silly doing this, the person like you is going to be silly doing it too. And you can laugh at that. Uh, go ahead and do that. When you're done with that, please put the blue box up front, and so I'll know that everybody's done when all the blue boxes come up front. 
Um, and then I have a couple of closing things to say after that. Um, but uh, we'll probably get out a little bit early because of, uh, I don't think this will take us 45 minutes to do.